if you start looking at the free cash flow numbers of the big producers, that's hope for you, right? So if there, if you need a reason, if you need one reason to invest in gold and silver right now, that that's what you want to see. That's why Buffett bought Barrick. That's why the bigger investors are going in there. It's the, for the free cash flow yield. And they're beating everybody else in the markets right now. Just wait till the end of Q4. We had still at the $1,900 gold price environment, $25 silver. Uh, companies are making money hand over fist. The land of Arcadia. Hello there, my friends. Chris Marcus here with you for Arcadia Economics. Welcome on in to another week of gold and silver and trading in our interesting financial world with an interesting US political election. I'm still not sure if it's decided or not. I hear a lot of mixed things. Kai, if you haven't figured out, you can let everybody know today. Um, although it's a pleasure to have Kai Hoffman from Soar Financial here joining us today. Kai, how are you doing, my friend? Doing great. For a Monday, I'm doing pretty well. Thanks for asking. Thanks for having me on the show, man. Yeah, well, and real quick, before we get started, I would like to mention today's episode is being brought to you by First Majestic Silver. As I think anyone who's seen the show knows, I'm a big silver fan. So getting leverage to First Majestic Silver is something I've been doing for years. As I wait for the eventual silver explosion, which I still very much think is coming, given that quick look over here at today's headlines, more fiscal stimulus is needed, Bill Dudley says. Uh, somehow I'm sure, uh, vaccines will benefit from stimulus. It seems to the Fed, Kai, that everything benefits from stimulus. If there's global warming, uh, print up some more digital dollars. Uh, what, what is going on with the Fed, gold and silver? Where do you see this whole thing? Well, all, all arrows point upwards, right? But uh, you, you talk about, you, you, you listen to, let, let, let's assume Biden won. And uh, Trump hasn't exhausted all his options yet, so it's not a hundred percent clear victory yet because uh, uh, there's still some legal battles going on. But uh, let's just assume Biden has won, and uh, we'll see a seven billion dollar stimulus package uh, sent on its way eventually. Um, Built back better, I think, is the title of it or the name of it. Uh, I'm not sure what, what it all implies, but of course, there's going to be massive spending on infrastructure. He's promising like 10 million jobs in, in the green energy wave as well. So in terms of the metals, and that's what we're looking at, we're going to have a, a golden future ahead of us, or even a silver or precious metals future ahead of us. Uh, the money has to flow somewhere. And if you look at it, like 7 trillion, that's a big number. I don't know what the GDP of the US is right now. But uh, it must be, be I think, I've read somewhere it's half, but don't quote me on it. Like, I'm not a macroeconomist. Of course, I follow the headlines. I see what's going on. And uh, I, I build my own opinion on stuff. But I'm not a technical analyst. So I was quite happy to see bounce, 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 uh, gold bounce off at 1850, the support level, despite having one of the biggest uh, sell-off days in recent history. Um, that, that's, that's good for me to see because we're still in the trading range. That means, like, traders and investors, we're still on the right side of the gold trade right now. I'm sure hoping so, and see, uh, interesting. I will pull up today's uh, silver chart. Quite a volatile day. We see another one of these uh, just big plummets down. Uh, does that make sense that we're seeing more volatility in both of the metals? I mean, it is. Uh, we've seen silver a couple months ago. It was 18 bucks for uh, where it stood below 20 for four years, uh, then sparked above that up to 29, down to 22, kind of floating around. 24, 25 bucks for a while. Is that to be expected even uh, in a normal rally? Uh, what, what do you think, Kai? Well, looking back, and I think the first time I said buy the dip was in May in a Kitco interview. And uh, that's when the sort of investors figure it out. Like, we, we can't escape the, the death spiral we're sort of in, right? And silver, gold, same thing. Um, and it's more of a reflection of the real markets. The S&P, the Dow Jones are not a reflection of the real market anymore. Uh, too much printing has been going on and investors have to put their money in the big stocks that are manipulating the overall markets. So um, those, those big stocks, the FANG stocks plus Microsoft maybe and a couple others are sort of manipulating the overall like picture. So people are still lulled into thinking that the market always goes up. Stocks always go up, like uh, the Barstool president said. Um, so lulling the retail investor in the same facts. And that doesn't make sense anymore. So I'm quite happy to see the volatility in gold because it shows there actually is a market, a real market out there as well. And it, it's healthy. Like it flushes out some weaker hands, gets some, some stronger buyers, uh, allows some trading. And uh, the, you can see the gold price and silver price both react to daily news. 
the real market doesn't do that anymore. As, as I said, it keeps going up and it uh, doesn't matter. Like the, the market actually loves the hung uh, parliament, or not parliament, but the hung government maybe in the US right now. Uh, if the, uh, was it the runoff election in Georgia comes back Republican, uh, you'll have at least two years of a Republican Senate and a Demo most likely Democratic president. So we're gonna see two years of not much happening. Most likely, that's at least what the market expects. The market loves that obviously, because that doesn't mean there'll be a lot of corporate uh, tax increases or anything like that it would be hindersome to business. Um, while gold is more volatile, more fickle that way and uh, reacts more sensitive to those or silver as well. And um, I keep coming back to gold. <laughs> and um, so there's more real, real picture of the market. I think if investors want to get a real idea of what's happening in the markets, they should follow the precious metals and not just the main markets. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I'm wondering what you would say. A lot of folks, they've watched, especially the tech shares, whatever is hot at the given time. I mean, really for the last decade, we've seen these things soar, uh, especially in the last year. I mean, Tesla, last time it looked, was up 10x in the last year, coincidentally, since the Fed started the repo lines. A lot of people who've been expecting similar in gold and silver, or there's some frustration out there. They, people, Some people don't like waiting. Uh, what would you say to people who are kind of feeling those two emotions and how to balance that? Well, I think we're at the end of a very, very long, dark tunnel, right? So there is light. And uh, if you start looking at the free cash flow numbers of the big producers, that's hope for you, right? So if, there, if you need a reason, if you need one reason to invest in gold and silver right now, and even if it's just the producers, I'm not talking to junior explorers or miners at this level, that, that's what you want to see. That's why Buffett bought Barrick. That's why the bigger investors are going in there. It's the, for the free cash flow yield. And they're beating everybody else in the markets right now. I don't have the numbers. I should have looked them up before our interview. But uh, they're blowing the big tech companies out of the water in terms of free cash flow yield and uh, or even the main markets. So uh, you'll see more of that. And once the general audience starts catching on, I think the Q of three numbers are just out now. So uh, the market has a little more time to digest that. But uh, even a year end, just wait till the end of Q4. We had still at the $1,900 gold price environment, $25 silver. Uh, companies are making money hand over fist right now. Um, and we're seeing already the slow start of maybe a bit of an M&A wave happening, like Endeavor and Taranga merging. Uh, I think it was Saracen and Northern Star in Australia merging. We'll see a lot more activity. And uh, if the free cash flow don't, doesn't convince you, maybe it's not the dividend yields just yet, but uh, I'm not sure what else will, at least for the majors. So. Yeah, I appreciate you mentioning that. And perhaps now that we're seeing some of the third quarter earnings, I'd love to hear any thoughts you have where, again, things got very skewed in the second quarter. Then we've finally seen the metal prices higher. I find in the American perspective, one thing that often gets lost is the extent. Okay, 1800, 1900, they're both good. One's better. How much better? Um, what have you seen with the earnings so far uh, that you can put that in context for people? I haven't followed the club, the big producer. All I look is like really like are they producing free cash flow and what's the yield, right? So that's what I'm sort of looking at. Um, and and eighteen hundred versus nineteen hundred, it bit, depends a bit on the cost basis. For some companies, nineteen hundred dollars is not much better than eighteen hundred because they're producing at a very low cost. So percentage wise, uh, their margin doesn't increase that much. But for a very high cost producer, a hundred dollar margin it can mean the world. It can almost mean 100% in increase in revenue or so, right? If you're a very high cost producer, just to put that a bit into perspective. And uh, like you, you see that also the mid tiers now are producing free cash flow. Uh, there are quite a few single asset producers out there that might have to diversify. ESG is one topic there as well. Uh, country risk and political risk, they need to diversify. Um, so if, if you're looking into that space, that's where I probably would hedge my, or where I personally would put my money if you were to put in money into the gold space, invest in investment space, uh, go further down the food chain. Uh, of course, everybody will flock to the Barracks, the Newmonts, the Kinrosses, and uh, Agonico. I forgot who the big four ones. There's Goldfields and others uh, out of Australia. But uh, that's where the money usually flocks to. But uh, look at the, the, the second level. There's a uh, Kirkland Lake has been producing fantastic numbers. Uh, I think I've only seen one company. I've briefly looked at, the, I think it was an RBC or Haywood weekly, weekly chart of uh, working capital. That's one thing I look at as well, like increasing working capital for those companies, because that also foreshadows or it gives you a hint who might be active on the M in the end uh, on the M&A side. Yeah, and I appreciate that uh, staying ahead of what's happening. But I mean, it makes a lot of sense because sometimes you see certain stocks 
that are going to move first because of the way the markets are set up, investor psychology, and if you know that they're going to lead a sector and you can get in what hasn't moved yet, certainly can be a good thing to do. Um, Kai, let's take that same uh, concept and perhaps for the uh, silver fanatics like myself, $18 silver versus $25 silver. And perhaps, uh, again, uh, fortunate tonight's episode sponsored by First Majestic. There's a stock that a lot of people know about. So can you talk at all about uh, them as a great example, how that impacts their bottom line in the silver space with that increase in price? Uh, well, the increase in price, like it's a lot of the silver producers, I don't know First Majestic's all on sustaining cost top of my head. I think it was around $13, but correct me if I'm wrong. And, and that makes a huge difference. $18, let's, let's assume $18 was originally forecast, that's, uh, that's $5. But now we're at $25, that's another 125% in, in, in bottom line revenue that should be hitting the bottom line, right? Uh, it's the same with other uh, silver producers as well. It's quite curious to see what, you got AXU on there, uh, Lexco is one I'm following closely. I've been to their site, uh, yep. Kino Hill last summer i'm just trying to think like it all it's all a blur now these days but uh, it was last summer so um and and first majestic has some interesting mines like san dimas and uh, santa elena are fairly low cost mines so they should be churning out uh, quite a bit of cash flow and i remember briefly looking at the first majestic numbers they are producing very solid free cash flow these days so and that that's something investors want to see and i think first majestic is the only Let's, let's say pure pure silver play left, and uh, I think they're at roughly seventy percent uh, metals mix uh, in terms of silver gold. So um, the, all the others that uh, like Pan American, Hecla, Core, they're all more down to fifty percent or even lower in terms of uh, gold to silver ratio. Yeah, and uh, question on First Majestic. I think a lot of people have found this one interesting. Uh, if you look at the year to date first majestic here it is uh let's say 1195 i think at the beginning of the year that was with 18 dollars silver first majestic and they're not the only one so several of these stocks are down even given the increase in the silver price is that just another example of we're waiting for the market to catch up and hopefully we're right and they're going to find out what we know or what, what would you say to folks? I know a lot of people have wondered about that. Uh, no, it's, it's, it's actually, that's a, that's a good point. And, uh, so first majestic has some tax issues in Mexico and I wouldn't say tax issues, but there's been a, a, a deal with the Mexican government or not even a deal. There's been a lawsuit and I don't know all the specifics there, but uh, it's about $200 million that first majestic might be on the hook for. And it's based on the forward sales of silver they've done a few years ago. And the Mexican government come, came back and said, okay, we actually have to tax you on that differently. Well, all in all, it's like they're on the hook. They might be on the hook for $200 million. They're countersuing now. Um, they're going in, uh, what's the term for it? They're after so. I'm missing a legal term. Don't forget I'm German, so I don't know all the words yet. Um, that's a, our legal words are usually not the uh, most important ones. But, I think so, uh, but, but so that's, that might be hanging over the stock a little bit because $200, $200 million is a, bit, a big chunk of change. Uh, but also, as you as you said, the general market has not looked at gold and silver miners the same way as everybody. As as we have, we're inter industry insiders. We might be probably pretty blind to what's going on outside of this sector, um, and and of course, we're all convinced that the stocks should go up. But we're still trading at eighteen dollar levels, nineteen dollar levels for silver. Uh, it feels like we're still trading at twelve fifty, thirteen hundred dollar levels for some of the gold stocks. That the penny hasn't dropped for a lot of investors. Um, and one thing is like I'm starting to get a little more wary of because I've been hearing it a lot is if everybody says it should go up, it usually doesn't. And I'm trying to figure out why it shouldn't go up. So I'm looking for reasons why it shouldn't go up. Seven billion, uh, seven trillion dollar stimulus package. Okay. Yeah. That, that's a good reason to go up. Right. But why shouldn't it go up? Like, so I'm looking for the negatives now. It's like my, the German in me is starting to come out and I'm starting to figure out like, why shouldn't it go up? Is it for silver? Maybe because there's industrial demand, uh, maybe the the large producers where silver is a byproduct have, can, can dump silver cheaper in the markets. I have no idea. Like, and that's what I'm looking for. Maybe you're the silver bug and expert. Maybe you have a couple more pointers on that than I have. I, I would be honored to offer a response to that one. My guess is that <clears throat> there's still a lot of the, is this going to be like 2016 mindset going around? I hear from time to time the, well, you know, all the other fund managers aren't in it yet. So I don't want to put my neck out there. And then if it goes bad, 
um, is that optimal trading based in what I've been trained in? I don't know. I guess maybe I look at it differently. But yeah, I think there's a, a bit of that happening, uh, perhaps some other things going on. And um, I wonder if in the same way we saw silver when it finally moved, it moved big. I wonder if we won't see the same for some of these mining stocks. Kai, for folks who are expecting at some point $50 silver or beyond, whether it's particular names you want to mention or even just characteristics, for people who think there's a big move in silver coming and at some point, you know, people really try and get a lot of money into a small market and the silver price really moves. Um, hopefully my ticker will come back here in a second. Are there any particular companies or types of companies that you would want to focus on in that environment? Well, just like you, you mentioned, you, you, for silver, for example, you will have to go with the big ones at first. That's the safest bet. Uh, you can't pass up a First Majestic. You even or a Pan American silver. You just can't pass up on those if you want to participate early on. Uh, but I, th I believe you'll get the most torque out of companies like you have an Alexco on there um, that is about to go into production or smaller producers. And keep in mind, the silver space in general is very, very small. So most silver is produced at byproducts. There are not a lot of uh, high, uh, pure silver mines. As I said, First Majestic, probably the only one with the highest uh, silver gold ratio of roughly 70%. So uh, also with exploration companies, of course, um, grade is not always king in silver. So uh, keep, in mind, keep that in mind as well. Of course, high grade is always nice, uh, but it needs to be economic in the end. So if it's narrow vein, for example, just take a close look at it. Uh, you'll get quite a bit of torque out of those stocks as well, because all of a sudden those, those mines become hugely profitable. Um, there are a few past producing silver mines that would be worth looking at. I know there's some stuff happening in Idaho. Um, th I, that's where, where I would allocate more of my capital. I'm not usually a big blue stock investor. That's uh, I'm trying to play the advantages that I have is knowing a lot of the junior mining CEOs and having direct access in case I do have a question. Um, although it's like I've interviewed for uh, Keith, Keith Newmeyer on, on SF Live as well. Um, I, I pers that's personal, right? I allocate rather a smaller portion of my portfolio to the larger ones. It doesn't say anything about the quality of the company. It's more that I'm more, and I'm still younger. I'm only 36 years old. So I'm still the vision that I can start over again if I lose all my money tomorrow. Um, I'm going to go higher risk more for the Alexco developers, but also exploration juniors. There's a few interesting ones uh, like a GR Silver, full disclosure, I own stock and I'm their client. Uh, I like what they're doing. They've, they've delivered over the last two years. They're growing. They bought actually an asset from First Majestic. Um, I like Bunker Hill. Bunker Hill is going through a restart. That's going to be really interesting. That is ultra high risk. They have a lot of challenges, uh, but that's more of a polymetallic silver uh, lead zinc mine in Idaho. Take a look at that one. Uh, new, the the ex-CEO of Barrick went into that one as chairman. So um, there's a lot of credibility around the management, a lot of challenges on the ground, but uh, I think that's an interesting one. Uh, who else in the service space? I mentioned high grade. So, so visualize, obviously, you visualize resources in everybody's mouth right now. So um, high grade always impresses. So take a look, take a look at the geology there. Uh, I think you can make some money on stocks like that. They will run if silver explodes, obviously. But uh, I'd, I'd rather go to a little later stage, um, so right around the development timeline uh, as a novice investor, because I think that's where you get the most torque without having too much detailed knowledge about the geology or management behind it. Yeah, and just so that people at home understand, would it be kind of a shift of the spectrum versus, hey, these guys have silver versus these guys are out looking for silver, so there's more variables. If you find the guy that we don't know if they have silver, but they find it and the price rises, then you're going to get probably a higher multiple payout. But that's the spectrum people can at least think about for themselves. Exactly. So the, the run up in silver just over in July as well, like silver stocks exploded. Uh, companies I mentioned like GR Silver had a great run up. They came back since. So that's why I think there's a good opportunity because a lot of money tried to walk into a very small door or through a small door. Um, so you actually can't go wrong with almost any of the silver companies. Like in, in a nutshell, if you stay pure silver, um, there are other good companies. I like what Discovery Metals is doing. Good friend Tyre Singh is running that one. Um, see what they're they're working on a high grade resource within a, a massive. I think it's a billion ounces or silver or something. It's an insane number. But there's they're working on a, a higher grade initial resource there. Uh, that's looking quite interesting. Take a look at that one. So it's like there's there's opportunity in this space. And once money starts flooding in, I think all the stocks will benefit. And then you just got to find your your sweet spot if it's the early stage explorer, the the developer, or the producer. Yeah, that's certainly what I'm looking forward to. 
I guess to answer the question some people raise of the market's manipulator, the printing goes on, but the price stays low, why bother? Um, that's exactly why I think if you have the patience for that can work out well. One thing you mentioned earlier was the dividends. And some I've heard I've gotten the question of, well, if the market's gonna value these things like they are, but I mean, if the price of the metals continues rising, continues to rise, and uh, you know, let's say the share prices of these miners, I mean, are we gonna be facing some massive dividends at some point or at some point, if the if you really have if you had like fifty or sixty dollars silver, these companies are going to have a lot of money. What, what do they do with it? Will we see dividends? Well, a couple of companies already announced dividends or increased dividends as well. Personally, I'm not the biggest fan of dividends. Um, like for for the produce for the in the precious metal sector, of course, it makes sense if you own a Johnson and Johnson that's paid dividends for 120 years or something straight. Uh, of course, that makes sense as a as a blue chip portfolio. But for me, it's like I want to see growth and shareholder value being increased. And how do you do that? Yeah, well, you produce uh, you produce more ounces economically, so you grow the production. I'm hoping for sensible, and that's really important. Sensible acquisitions, not like we've seen before, where companies had to write down billions and billions of dollars eventually. Um, so smart acquisitions, that's what I'm looking for. And I don't really care about a percent and a half, 2% in dividends uh, every year. Uh, I'd rather see 10% in share price increase than uh, 2% in dividends, right? So um, that's what I'm looking for. And I want the companies to actually do more. Uh, I'm a junior resource or a junior exploration investor. Uh, most of my money is actually in junior exploration stocks. Call me stupid for it. But uh, I have a very high risk tolerance. So I want them to start going on the M&A train and start buying buying some juniors to exp to expand, like Barrick's production profile has been dropping off. And uh, one eye-opening fact was when they had, were roughly around 4.8 million ounces produced, they were forecasting over the coming years to go down to 4 million ounces a year, right? Like th those ounces need to be replenished. And uh, the, the big market, the, the, the big investor journalists want to see resource growth and production growth. And that's what I want to see. Like it's the same as Amazon, like not stopping to invest in their technology, right? And I, I want, the companies to start grow, uh, keep growing at a reasonable pace and use use my money to do so. Yeah, which makes sense because I mean, let's say you get the dividend. I mean, probably going to be looking where do I put the dividend now. So in the end, I think it comes back at least for me, and I think what I'm picking up from what you're saying as well. If you have management teams that you like the way they operate, the way they go after things, I mean actually uh, and that's what i appreciate about what you're doing and sharing your insight because i know you go to the conferences you know all these guys and you know i think it's great that people can be bullish on silver they can think the price is going up and then you can find someone like i don't want to be the ceo of a silver company i don't want to study all that stuff i'm going to understand that but i mean i want to find someone hey this guy knows what he's doing i want him to manage the projects uh so i appreciate you touching on that and one last question before perhaps you can tell people how they can get access to some of your insight there. You mentioned that you are German and I'm wondering, you talk with Americans, uh, you talk with Canadians. What is the German perspective on gold and silver? Are they seeing the same thing? Are they concerned about the money printing? Obviously, uh, when you have that history of Weimar Germany, I found many of the German people I meet, they're conscious of these things what what would you share on that we're extremely conscious of those things as germans like as, as you said the weimar the hyperinflation of 1929 is imprinted in our dna right so we know uh how it feels how you, how it is to to walk to the bakery with a bucket full or with a basket full of money that's pretty much worthless just to buy a loaf of bread so we we know how to secure our assets and germany based on the world uh World Gold Council report is the biggest buyer of bullion right now, German investors. Where by far, I think we bought 81 tons in Q3 in, in bullion, physical gold, uh, far out spending the Swiss even, or like the, the Americans are not even listed on like the, the top three report, right? So um, like- Well, we're, Kai, we're, remember Ben Bernanke doesn't understand gold. He said he doesn't know anybody else who does either. So apparently it's not a big thing in the Fed. So, right. So there's lots of, lots of demand out of Germany. We understand it. And of course, people that understand gold often look at the gold stocks as well. They see they can make money. And uh, I have to say back in 2015 or even parts of 2019, the European market carried the Canadian market in terms of uh, share price valuation and volume. So while Canadian investors and North American investors almost disappeared from the space, uh, the Europeans were still there sort of support. 
and uh, that, that that's a good thing to see. Well, I appreciate that. And Kai, perhaps just in wrapping up, uh, you could let folks know about your website. I have it pulled up here and some of the different things that you offer that can be of help to the folks watching. Fantastic. Yeah, no, appreciate that. At SoarFinancial.com, as it is highlighted above here, uh, Soar Financial Partners, we host conferences. We do daily interviews with uh, CEOs at on Twitter at Soar Financial is the, is the handle there. Or in Inc., we're tracking all the financings in this space. So companies that are listed on the TSX, TSX Venture, and CSE. And Rohstoffbrief is a more of a German publishing uh, platform where we write about mining companies. You can go check that out as well. If you're fluent in German, uh, I think Google Translate does a decent job these days. It used to be way, it used to be much worse. It's doing a decent job now so yeah that's where you can find us at or inc on twitter as well so we've got two channels going there but the ads or financials where we host interviews regularly with ceos as well and uh yeah analysts and uh, market commentators like yourself as well we recently had you on uh a few weeks ago as well yeah and it was fun talking about the markets uh, i hope we'll be able to do this more often i think there's a lot of i run into a lot of the People I bring on this show and folks in my audience who are aware of the good things you're doing. Um, so it's fun to catch up with you as always. Thanks for being here. And I might add one of the guests that you recently had on the SOAR Financial Partners was Keith Newmeyer, uh, who runs First Majestic Silver tonight sponsor. In fact, Kai, uh, normally I link to an interview I've done with Keith for one of their sponsored episodes. But I think today we will link to the one you did with Keith. So people can hear Appreciate your that. insight and folks that is coming your way now.